Hi, Misha here, and we're going to talk about a very interesting aircraft. Hesitate to call it a bomber. Might call it an attack aircraft. It's had lots of names and designations, and really holds a special place in history. The Douglas Invader. Call it the A-26 or B-26. This served through three major wars. World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. It was really the last propeller-driven bomber-slash-attack aircraft in the U.S. Air Force. And it was the fastest production bomber America had in World War II. It dropped the first bombs and the last bombs in Korea. And it did a damn good job of disrupting the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Vietnam. So, yeah, let's talk about this. We have three examples here, all 172 scale die casts from Hobby Master, two of which you've had on the channel before. One has never been featured. Over here, we have the A26B, aka B. 26B. In the middle, we have the A26C, later AF26C, or B26C, or RB26C. And then finally, we have the A26K, aka A26BB, or a 26A, also named the Counter Invader. And yeah, these are kind of the major variants. And we have one from the 40s, one from the 50s, and one from the 60s. So, with that, let's dive in and go back to the early days of the Second World War. And by the way, if you'd like to toss a buck, I've always had a Patreon over on the Mishiko channel. That can work the same for this channel too. Why not? After all, these planes have guns on them, even if they're tiny in 172 scale diecast. Let's begin with the A26B solid nose or all purpose nose version. This was the ground attack variant, although it wasn't initially called for. Going back, Douglas had great success with the A-20 Havoc, also known as the Boston. And after that, Ed Hyman, someone we'll talk about quite a bit. In fact, I've got two other videos on Hyman's uh, other designs I just I somehow I really like his simple elegant versatility robustness I mean the the a4 is a personal favorite jet of all time anyway but this is going back to World War two and he was the lead designer on an updated improved version of the a20 although we must talk, give credit for the new wing system the, the wing design to Ted Smith. He really did come up with this uh, new wing which was hoped to really propel it to higher speeds and give it more versatility. The prototype was the XA26 and initially the US Army Air Corps was hoping to get a night fighting variant. The British had been using uh, Boston's for that and getting a, a light, tactical, medium altitude, precision bomber. That was kind of the two systems. Although even before the first prototype flew on July 10, 1942, that June right before, they added a third configuration, which would become the XB, excuse me, XA-26 
B, which was a, a ground attack version, a strafing version. Uh, this had really proven its worth already in World War II. So we had three variants kind of flying. And they would be prototypes, usually I think just one prototype of each. Now, just to get it out of the way, the XA26, the, the A variant, was meant to be the A26A, which is a night fighter. It was an interesting design. For one, it didn't require a co-pilot. It could be flown effectively by one person. Although it had a crew of two with the other person you know, doing the other work, navigation, working the radar, perhaps working the guns. It um, had a radar in the front solid nose, which is really where the first solid nose came from. And it had 20 millimeter cannon, four of them in a gun pack, underslung. But its internal bomb bay could only carry about 2,000 pounds because of everything else going on. But it did have one turret remotely operated with a couple of 50 cows in it. It might have had potential, but it in a fly-off with the P-61 Black Widow, the Black Widow would, would win. So the initial A-26A was canceled. So outside of the prototype, never really made. But that's okay. The A-26B, the attack version, and the A-26C, those were given the go-ahead. Initial testing was more or less positive. They were quite fast, achieving, uh, depending on exactly which variant and thing, and testing about 360 miles per hour. Good handling. Other characteristics that were well-liked, easy for one person to handle and control, which was good. However, they had some engine overheating problems. They were using Pratt & Whitney engines. They were overheating, so they had to redesign those and the propellers, the spinners. They also had to uh, redesign the front landing gear because it had a nasty habit of collapsing. Keep in mind, tricycle landing gear were pretty new advent at this time. Plus, on top of all that, the Douglas factory was very, very busy. In fact, they had two factories, one in California, one in Oklahoma. So it really wasn't until 1943 things were ready to go. And uh, June 30th of that year, the... Uh, U.S. Army Air Corps, soon to become the U.S. Army Air Forces, would officially select, adopt, and order both the 26B variant here and the 26C. But it seems like priority was given to the 26B. I will say that the majority of those were built in California, with the majority of C's built in Oklahoma. At the, they were both Douglas plants, but just different ones. So what do we have here? This is roughly 50 feet long with a 70 foot wingspan. The B model with the machine gun nose was capable of reaching about 350 miles per hour. They could squeeze a couple more miles out if it was a little bit lighter loaded. It had a crew of three and by the way, it had a max altitude of about 28 to 29,000 feet. Had a crew of three. You had your pilot in the traditional left seat. Next to him was the navigator and loader. He would reload the machine gun nose. The pilot would fire, fire the machine guns, but he would kind of maintain them. And then the third crew could operate the radio, but he mostly hung out in the back here in this uh, gunner's compartment. And he had a very interesting turret, or barbette, as they sometimes called them, system. They were remotely controlled, and he would sight using a periscope. And when there were two, at least early on, dorsal and ventral, depending on how he would aim and move, it would automatically switch between them. This would work well when it worked, but it was honestly more convoluted and complicated so oftentimes the turret would simply be locked in the forward position and add to the uh, forward facing armament. Depending on the exact variant, it could carry roughly 6,000 pounds in an internal bomb bay. Fun fact, if there were bombs in the bomb bay, the, uh, the gunner could not go from his compartment 
to the cockpit, but if the bomb bay were empty, he could actually uh, crawl slash walk up there. But it's not the only crawling that'll be done in this plane. We'll get to that in a minute with the C. Another fun fact. This has the uh, standard later 8-gun, all 50 cal Browning nose. But early on, they weren't really sure. They tried out several things. In fact, the earliest test models had a 75mm howitzer cannon. Good in theory, didn't work out in practice. They tried some uh, other cannon, like 37mm, 20mm, kind of like the uh, Night Fighter. They just didn't work out. So the first production 26Bs had a 6-gun nose. Mostly just an artifact of having tried putting cannons in there. But once they decided to go to uh, all machine guns, they would uh, up it to 8. And this could carry as many as 6,000 rounds of 50 caliber BMG. And uh, there would be variations and different things. And they could put a lot of guns, plus carry a respectable bomb load, even in this version. Although, they could also carry a fuel tank in the bomb bay besides. And like I said originally, there was a ventral and a dorsal turret, or barbette. But the ventral one was quite quickly removed. Again, the system didn't work as well in practice as it did on paper. And the ventral was of limited use, took up weight. But most importantly, it was uh, replaced with an, another fuel tank in the belly there. So uh, more fuel, more range, more endurance, and... Uh, you know, just wasn't really felt like it was impeding much. But the, uh, the, the dorsal turret barbette would remain for some time. So that's the B variant here, the attack plane. The A-26C was the light bomber, medium altitude tactical. And it was quite, per, quite precise because it had the, at the time, very new and very high-tech and very esteemed Norden bombsite in this glass nose. And this glass nose had a very good field of view. And interestingly, the way Douglas designed it, the noses could be swapped in a matter of hours, so you could convert a B to a C, a C to a B, going back and forth, adding extra flexibility. Now this one is from 1955, I believe, so it was put into duty as an RB-26C, so the top turret was removed, but in the war it would have had it. Otherwise, it's there. Initially, the machine gun nose would be replaced with, like I said, this glass. But they would give it two 50 cals to help support. But very quickly in production, they were decided to be of no use. Instead, after, I don't know, 1,000, 1,500 planes had been built, they w went to a reinforced wing here, and they would start putting machine guns on the wings. You could either have three 50 cals in each wing bay, or you could hang 50 cal gun pods under the wings. The uh, C variant had uh, uprated Pratt & Whitney engines with water injection. It also had reinforced slightly stronger wings and it was capable of carrying 6,000 pounds internally, plus up to 2,000 pounds under the wings. So about 8,000 pounds. Because it was a little bit lighter in the nose and a little more aerodynamic, plus the better engines and stronger airframe, it was capable of reaching about 370 miles per hour. And this is what would make it the fastest, fastest, the fastest bomber America had in the war. And these could be mass produced. It was actually a, quite a good bomber in a lot of ways. Again, thanks to the the glass nose and the Norden bomb site. And just the overall good handling. 
depending on different situations just had a range of up to 3,000 miles with the ferry tank installed in the Bombay compartment but at first they didn't have the seas they would lag behind the uh, army would receive its first A-26 invaders in September of 1943 and they would quite quickly be deployed in the southwest, the Pacific Theater, against the Japanese. And how would they do? Back to the A-26B, since that's what was used in the Pacific. At first, they would have four operational planes in June 1944. First attack missions would be on the 23rd against various Japanese holdings. And very quickly, the uh, Air Corps, Air Forces members there weren't impressed. They didn't feel like it was well suited to the Pacific. It didn't have quite the range they wanted. They said that the, the visibility was not good for ground attacking. They couldn't easily see the ground. And even though more would come online in 1945, and they would see some limited use, mostly from March through July of 19, 1945, yeah, they never really they never really caught on there. As famously known, uh, uh, George McKinney, uh, the the general General McKinney, did not approve of it at all. He would rather hang on to the older Douglas A20 or the B-25 Mitchell. So yeah, it's, it's, it's thing in the Pacific wasn't great, but it did lead to some early changes. For example, the original cockpit canopy was v quite early replaced in production within the first year to this design to give better visibility. Couldn't really do much about the engine placement for blocking the view, but they could try to strengthen its ground attack ability by adding more guns. This is actually where we see the additional guns put in to the uh, C and some Bs too in the wings. They also have the ability to carry 5 inch rockets under the wings. At first 10, later 14 to give it better ground attack ability. It's also where we see the bottom turret removed to give more fuel. This was kind of the proving ground, but yeah, the uh, invader would never have much esteem in the Pacific. But Douglas would get another chance in September of 1944. The first 18 were sent to Europe. Again, they were the 26Bs. 26Cs were still in short supply. And this time, they pretty much had to make a good impression to ensure the aircraft's future. So beginning in November 1944, so we're talking around the time of the Battle of the Bulge, they started flying combat missions in that theater. And how did it do? We'll put the C back on the stand. Even though in November, two bomber groups officially started switching over, transitioning over in Europe to the 26C, they were still in short supply, so a lot of them were Bs, or 26Cs would kind of be group leaders for older A-20s and the B-26 Marauder. Another medium altitude, relatively light bomber. And in a word, it did much better. Uh, pilots and generals liked it, as did men on the ground. For various reasons, it was better suited to Europe. It would be used in bombing missions, of course, ground attack, strafing missions, also night missions, uh, finally, <laughs> as well as tactical reconnaissance. It would be used to kind of push back the Germans in November and December, and then in January 1945 it would stop, start operating out of Italy, kind of pushing the remaining fascists out. It would be used to uh, strafe tank columns, disperse troop formations, also uh, destroy railways, uh, 
and other depots and supply installations just, you know, be a raw pain in the ass. And we did well. By this point, more 26 Cs are available, so Bs and Cs are both operating into, into 45. And it would fly over 11,000 missions during World War II, dropping over 18,000 tons in bombs, destroying hundreds of vehicles, tanks, even was credited with destroying seven enemy aircraft. So it would, it would end the war quite well. Now, it wasn't without some cost. 67 invaders would be lost in Europe during its active but relatively brief stint there of about half a year and after the war of course production would essentially be over as most contracts were cancelled after World War II just very very roughly speaking we had about uh, 1350 of the B variant produced and a little over 1100 of the C variant uh, total mainline production was somewhere between 20, 2,450 and 2,500, depending on what we ask, and of course getting into prototypes and stuff. So slightly more Bs than Cs built, but again, they could be swapped back and forth, and as changes were introduced to one, they would often creep over to the other back and forth. It was a very successful aircraft, even though it had a slightly rough start, but no, it was in no way a... It was it's definitely a credit to... Ed and Douglas as a company doing well for itself. When the uh, U.S. Air Force became independent in 1947, they went to a new designation system. The A designator for attack was dropped. So in 1948, the old B-26 Marauder would be redesignated as the RB-26 for reconnaissance. It would only serve for a couple of years before finally being fully retired anyway. And this is when the A-26 would become the B-26. B-26B, B-26C. A little less confusing once the Marauder was retired in 1950. And by this point, the Invader was operated by Tactical Air Command, TAC. And even though no more were being produced... Hundreds would still be in service for the Korean War, and they would actually play a very important role, especially for night missions, but day as well. The Korean War definitely had quite a few World War II era aircraft in service on all sides, but of course it had the newer generation of jets, the MiG-15, the F-86, later versions of the meteor it was an interesting transitional war so it's not really shocking that the now b26 b and b26 c invaders were in service but it might be a little surprising just how much in service they were and for whatever reason i always think of the c when i think of korea even though the b's were used to one neat thing I wanted to show about the model. <clears throat> Remember how I said kind of crawling around? Well, this nose, it's removable on the Hobby Master. So you can place the figure in there. And he has kind of a little cradle he can lay in for the bomb side or photo version. By the way, the RB. 26C. It had, of course, photography gear instead of bombs in the bomb bay. It also carried flares for illuminating uh, targets at night. Anyway, he's there. You can move him there. In the airplane, the navigator, bombardier, would sit up beside the pilot, but then he would crawl through a small hatch and tunnel into the nose here. Some of the aircraft had uh, dual controls as well. They made sure to lock out the controls when he was crawling around. I don't know why I think that's kind of funny. And also on this Hobby Master you can remove the canopy. So you can 
insert or not your crew you have the pilot navigator seat and you do have the little folding jump seat for a third crew member back here pretty neat you can also remove the cover the canopy for the rear station although there's nothing in this because while we have the periscope and siding equipment no turret <clears throat> anyway the Korean War kicked off and the B-26 flying first out of Japan would have various missions over South Korea June 27, 1950. Then on June 29, the invaders, the C variant as it happens, would conduct the very first raid against North Korea on their own soil when they hit an airfield and airbase. And from there they would continue to fly and they would also transition from out of Japan to bases in South Korea. Uh, there were political reasons for this but also just of course logistic reasons. They would fly day and night initially although by the summer of 1951 they mostly were flying night missions. Not always but mostly. This probably explains why the seas seem to see a little more use. And they would be used to hit air bases and really attack a lot of rail, uh, railway installations, you know, railheads and rail locomotives and, and train yards, that kind of thing. But then of course other vehicles besides, they even use spotlights to um, kind of target that. But they flew pretty continuous missions even well into the into the jet age and then they would fly the last bombing raids of the war June 27 1953 less than a half hour before the armistice was signed B-26s would still have another bombing raid there would also be RB-26s like this one flying photo reconnaissance you know, aftermath reports, kind of seeing what damage was done, missions. There would even be a weather version, the WB-26, that, well, it monitored the weather because weather is kind of important when you're uh, talking, you know, combat. There was also a TB-26, a two-seat uh, uh, dual-control trainer. Essentially the same airplane, just, yeah. And a few other variants besides that were just customized for, for purpose. Really, Douglas and Hyman really made a very versatile little plane. By the end of the Korean War, they were credited with destroying over 38,000 vehicles, including over 400 uh, locomotives, you know, trains, plenty of other installations and things of that nature. A few more aircraft, I believe pretty much all on the ground, but still, you know, adding to their tally. Of course, they had their own losses. And by this point, a lot of the airframes are uh, kind of getting a little high hour. And they didn't serve a whole lot at the end of World War II, but they served in the interwar period. And uh, they served both with the active full-duty Air Force and the Air Force Reserves. The reserves were actually actually activated very early in Korea, and while some might consider them to be people past their prime, the truth is a lot of them were veterans of World War II and were excellent pilots and really helped the younger men find their feet, and a lot of them are familiar with bombers like this. So, no, they served with uh, considerable distinction during Korea, and their service would continue afterwards. Here's the B again with the rear canopy or compartment cover removed. You can see the siding system actually sticks out. He's in there pretty in depth. Again, he's using a periscope. And he has a seat up front if he can get to it as well. A little jump seat. In theory, I guess it could carry a passenger too. But yeah, they served after the war. 
in the Air Force. They would be used more and more as RB-26s and TB-26 trainers and so on. The Navy would acquire some, designating them the, uh, what was it, the, the JD-1, I believe. They were considered a utility transport. They just got a few, but it was to kind of fill a, a stopgap that the uh, Navy needed. But their time was coming to an end. A lot of the airframes were wearing out. Parts were getting more and more in short supply. And frankly, the jet age was just coming on. Really, the last active year was 1957. And then in 1958, they were officially retired, put into mothballs for the U.S. Air Force. But they still had a good number well over a hundred that were still serviceable. Maybe a fresh coat of paint and some new oil. And so you would think their career would end. After all, by this point, 1958, most World War II era aircraft, at least in the USA and Britain and France, were retired or very much on their way out. And you would think so for the Invader too. But oh no. It's about to get its second life, and frankly, it's probably most impactful. And it would actually kind of begin with the CIA, of all things. Picking this one up was the reason I finally decided to do this video, but believe it or not, we're still not quite there yet. Around 1960, the CIA got interested in the Invader, and they would have a few operations. End of that year, around December, they would start flying missions to kind of support the current Laotian government. These were unmarked, kind of black ops type missions. They had around a dozen 27BCs plus four RB26s around and doing different things to support them. They even modified a couple in 62 for additional night ops. 1961, though, would be a mother colorful year. They would actually give some to the Cuban rebels at the Bay of Pigs. Obviously, that didn't go swimmingly. But yeah, the invader was there, technically on both sides. And in that year, the first operations over South Vietnam would happen. Operation Farmgate. These were nominally under South Vietnamese control. They had South Vietnamese markings applied. They would uh, be stationed out of uh, Thailand. And they were, on paper, all RB-26s. So, on paper, unarmed reconnaissance. In reality, while there were some RB-26s operating there, there were plenty of armed B-26s of both variants flying 1962-63 in support of the South Vietnamese. However, in February of 1964, operations would come to an abrupt halt. There would be two crashes, one stateside at an air show, and one in theater in Southeast Asia. An investigation would quickly reveal that they were just suffering uh, stress to the fuselage, to the wing, they were old. You know, they were 20 years old. They'd fought through a couple of wars, other operations. So, yeah. In April, a firm decision was taken to ground the remaining invader fleet. Even though they were already out of U.S. Air Force service, even the CIA and Special Operations decided to kind of quit flying them. And on top of that, another Douglas aircraft would kind of get passed around to the Air Force at this time, the A-1 Sky Raider, formerly the A-80. And so other things were kind of filling the ground attack role. For any other plane, that would have been the end of it. And by all rights, it should have been. But finally, we come to the B-26 K, as it was known, and the name was Counter Invader. 
This was meant to be a low-tech, cost-effective way to counter insurgents on the ground. You know, guerrilla warfare, high-tech wasn't needed. Just kind of raw power and dogged determinations. May 30th, 1964, the first rebuilt aircraft known as YB-26K was ready to take to the skies for its maiden flight. Now, the invader kind of outlived its parent company, kind of. Douglas had, of course, merged with McDonald to become McDonnell Douglas. Anyway, they were busy with a little thing called the F-4 Phantom. So the reworking, rebuilding project was given to On Mark in California. And this actually started a little bit earlier. The CIA, others, had already reworked some, kind of giving them the eight-gun nose and refurbishing the weapons, upgrading the engines. But mostly they put a little strap underneath to strengthen the wings already. And that worked out really well. But the counter-invader is a pretty big rebuild. The fuselage was reinforced. The wing was reworked, like I said, with the strap. The, the tail section was totally redone, including the stabulators, horizontal and vertical. We had new gear. We had new braking systems new engines, new propellers. Notice these are kind of chopped off and stubbier. New avionics inside. We removed the third crewman back here. The rear position is pretty much empty. Typically just had two people. Dual controls were made standard. Most of these were converted from either B26Bs or TB. 26 B's, although a couple of C's were also used. When they rebuilt the wings, they plumbed them so they could have wing edge fuel tanks there. And, of course, the underwing installations. They removed the guns from the wings, but they added a four hard points under each wings and in total it could carry 8,000 pounds under there. Pretty much anything you would want of unguided ordnance. Bombs, rocket pods, napalm canisters, guns, even cannon pods in theory. The internal bomb load was still there but because of everything else it was slightly reduced to 4,000 pounds but overall it still could carry up to 12,000 pounds. And then, you know, compare that to World War II airplanes, it could carry about 8,000 total. So, a vast improvement. Thanks to the actual extra fuel and everything, it still had pretty good range. A total of about 2,700 miles. Still had a good maximum altitude of nearly 30,000 feet. Was a little slower at about 325 miles per hour. But it had decent loiter time, so, you know, ebbs and flows. Had, um... It, like I said, updated communications and everything. Had the nose guns, but no other turreted guns or anything like that. They just weren't really necessary. So 40 low-hour models were selected. And pretty much they would all be delivered between 1964 and 1965. And they would end up going to the Special Forces, the SOS group of the U.S. Air Force. But it's kind of funny, at first they really didn't know what to do with them. In the interim, they'd picked up some A-1 Sky Raiders from the Navy, and were using them in the kind of simple, close air support role. But then with CIA backing, some would be sent to the Congo to help out Belgian forces there in a clandestine manner. This would actually be the first time the B-26K counter-invader would um, see some service. And then, in 1966, a decision was taken to send these to Vietnam. And like I said, they had already been operating nominally under Vietnamese colors already, 
It's also worth pointing out that in the 50s, the U.S. would loan some invaders to France, and they would operate them in 1954. Dinh Bien Phu, that whole thing. So it wasn't the first time invaders had operated there. But there was a problem. They would be flying out of Thailand, and the Thai government did not allow U.S. bombers to fly from their territory. So, in May of 1966, the B-26K was redesignated as the A-26A. So finally, the first name this was ever meant to fly as would get used. Now, it was done for political reasons, but it was a ground attack aircraft. It wasn't really a bomber in the traditional sense, so hey, whatever. And they would start flying missions primarily to disrupt operations and supply on the Ho Chi Minh or Ho Chi Minh Trail. They had a few other things. They could still continue to fly some missions, again, very much clandestine over Laos. But mostly, yeah, these were used to disrupt the Ho Chi Minh Trail. In fact, two were given an early forward-looking infrared radar, FLIR, for use in night operations. Kind of an interesting use of early night vision. Of the 40 B-26Ks created, about 30 would see service in these operations. They would operate with the call sign Nimrod. <laughs> like I said, if you would go to Congo a couple would be kept stateside for training, so on and so forth. And they would fly a good number of missions. And they could uh, deliver quite a payload. And they had quite an um, array of ordnance under the wings. They kind of grabbed a little bit of everything because they didn't know what they would need. You'd see some Snake Eye Bombs, uh, Mark 81s, Mark 82s, Napalm Canisters... Regular, just iron bombs, 250, 500 pound. Do you think 750 pound was about the heaviest you saw on these? You would see some uh, law rocket pods. You'd see some gun pods. Yeah, they, they weren't picky. And of course, again, you had additional fuel in the tip tanks there. And if all else fails, you still had eight 50 cal Brownings in the nose for some good strafing. And at roughly 250 to 280 miles per hour cruising speed. And again, we have two pilots. So if one needed to rest or whatever, you know, auxiliary. But while these missions could be very effective, they're also very dangerous they would actually start withdrawing these beginning in the summer of 1968 as newer aircraft were becoming available including the RB57G and the Canberra and the final A26A flights would be in November of 1969 for one over a dozen had been lost or severely damaged to the point of inoperability. For another, pretty much all the airframes had reached their maximum allowed hours. You know, they rebuilt the fuselage, the wings, but they still only had so many hours left in them. And after, you know, two and a half years of flying very regular missions, that was it. They were just plum worn out. At this point, the airframes were 25 years old, and they were built in a time and a place long before. So yeah, they would be pulled out of theater before 1970 would roll around. In the USA, the last ones would be taken out of active U.S. Air Force Reserve Service by the end of 1972. And that would pretty much be it in the USA. There were a few foreign users, like I said, France. Indonesia would get about half a dozen invaders. Uh, Colombia would end up with some. Cuba would have some. 
and the last operations would be between 1976 and 77 in foreign service with the last ones officially retired by 1980 so by that point well over 30 years old closer to 40 not bad at all so yeah I just wanted to pick this one up to see how Hobby Master did they're kind of hard to find especially the Vietnam ones and uh, yeah they did the, the correct tail the correct spinners they actually come with quite a bit of ordnance there's a couple more uh, mark 82s and a couple more tanks so they give you pretty much twice the ordnance so you can kind of configure them however you like the um, tip uh, the tip tanks there on the wings just pop on they can you don't have to have them on of course the canopy opens up for your two crew on the regular release especially the World War II ones you can have the bomb bay open I don't believe on this one you can I didn't see an extra bomb bay in the packaging while the uh, counter invader could carry 250 500 pound bombs in the bay they were mostly known for their external ordnance because they often carried uh, snakes and napes basically iron bombs or cluster bombs for that matter and napalm canisters for attack attacking uh, softer targets like either people straight out or like trucks and things like that they weren't really meant to attack armored targets and certainly not really intended for hitting hard installations now this was you know attacking convoys something that the invader had always been quite good at and really the counter invader made it that much better especially the ones with the flare in the front that have been kind of interesting but now I was curious to see how Hobby Master did this one to me want to find one for a good price by the way they I think I already mentioned they pulled the 50 cal guns out of the wings if the planes had them just to save on weight plus they needed that room for the reinforcing strap up in there and for the hard points and I'm sure for the plumbing for the tip tanks as well but yeah what an interesting aircraft with a long service and a very flexible service too but I expect nothing less from Ed Hyman and the Douglas Company. So yeah, while I don't have an early variant, I think Hobby Master has only done one early canopy version. In fact, they haven't done many World War II versions. I feel lucky to have this one. There is a small printing error on this plane. All of them had it. I wonder if you noticed it. I actually got it for a good price because of that. As for the RB26, I just wanted a, a uh, glass nose version, and uh, that worked as good as any. Plus, I thought being a 50s era one was needed. And I always wanted a counter invader, but for a long time they were just too expensive and hard to find, especially, like I said, the Vietnam era ones. They do have a, a Congo version coming out next year, but... That'd be nice, but yeah, this is what I wanted. Luckily, uh, Pete's Collectibles had a few left. And I used a bit of a discount to get them for pretty much retail price. Maybe like 20 bucks more, but better to get what you want than to save 20 bucks and not really get it. But I am happy that they, again, did the correct propellers. And how well the ordinance and everything does stay on the wing. The right tail. I don't believe this rear compartment opens. I mean, I guess you could pry it open, but on these other two, it um, you know pops right open. But uh, yes, it doesn't. One of the things I can say about them: the crew kind of sit loose, which is pretty common for World War II bombers. Put a little bit of blue tack on their butts or on their backs. Sticks them in there real good. The stands are okay. The stems are actually metal. And they actually are cradled in there. They don't peg in so there's not a big hole. But because this is a relatively wide plane. And it's almost entirely metal and so very heavy. 
it is a little wobbly, so I've only knocked one over once during this whole video. <laughs> but um, yeah, make sure whatever surface you put them on is flat. And make sure you don't actually hit the wings. Other than that, though, they're pretty durable. Again, uh, you know, they're uh, pretty much all metal. I think one of the tail pieces might be plastic. But I really do like them. I would say definitely the Counter Invader is my favorite, followed by the glass nose version. I just like how the crew you can put in there. And that's not to, you know, display this one. I like it for being a World War II one. So they're all neat in their own ways. And back when I got these, they weren't that expensive. I think I paid 70 bucks nowadays. Well, nothing's cheap, is it? But yeah, I wanted to share kind of a... It's not my favorite plane, of course, but... A plane that I think gets overlooked, especially it's uh, Korean and Vietnamese, or Vietnam service. So, yeah. I think next time it will do the A1. What do you think? Or maybe the A4. There's a lot of neat things to do. And one day when I feel like it will do a big U.S. Air Force video. But I'm going to need time for that. I'm still recovering from the big British videos. <laughs> Anyway, let me know what you think. What's your kind of favorite configuration? What you think of this combat service and its uh, longevity? The Douglas Company really had some good, sturdy planes. They may not have been the the best thing ever, but they they just they last. The A1, the A4, yeah, they just they built planes that last. The even like the old SBDs. With that, appreciate you tuning in today. This is Misha. Catch you very soon next time.